Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Today, we have a very special guest. Been looking forward to this conversation, Natalie Smolinski. I hope I got that right. <laughs> She's shaking her head, so it looks like it looks like I did. Anyways, before I get her on stage, I want to give a shout out to the awesome Bitcoin companies that make this show possible. Of course, swanbitcoin.com, best place to buy Bitcoin, built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. Also, check out their new IRA product. It just launched. And of course, the big, biggest Bitcoin conference in the world, Bitcoin 2023. It's going to be hosted in sunny, sunny Miami Beach, Florida, May 18th through the 20th. You can use promo code to get 10% off your tickets to Bitcoin 2023. Anyways, Natalie, happy to have you on the show. How are you doing? Great to be here. Thank you. Did I get your last name right? You sure did. You hear that, guys? Nico, <laughs> Nico's uh, stepping up in the world. Um, anyways, Natalie, I've been fascinated about your stuff. Uh, you know, the, I think the first time I heard you was on the Peter McCormack podcast. And the way that you were talking about uh, just and please step in if, if you think I, I'm phrasing this incorrectly. The way that you are speaking about how the American empire or just America is degrading in, in such a way um, fascinated me. And because, you know, we've been I think a lot of people are really fe feeling what's going on, but they can't really put it into words. So if you could be so kind, like what is your perspective about what's going on? What what went wrong? What got us here? Sure. So. Um in the cycle of civilizational rise and decline, um, there's typically a period of consolidation of resources in which an empire builds up um, pools of resources, um, often through conquest, um, but also through trade, um, which kind of feed the economic growth and expansion of the empire. Um, then generally what happens is there's a population explosion in the empire, um, particularly among the elite class um, who reproduce quickly and who use vastly more resources than uh, the rest of the population. Um, as the ability of the empire to take in resources um, or to find external sources of resources uh, diminishes, there, um, there reaches a kind of point past which it can no longer grow. Um, and at that point, it becomes kind of a game of musical chairs um, where people, particularly elites, start vying for scarcer resources. Um, and it's that elite infighting um, because elites tend to control the military, the political apparatus, the financial system, um, that infighting between elites tends to factionalize society. Um, and then often these periods also uh, include uprisings from uh, the lower classes who are upset that in a world of shrinking, diminishing resources, they have even less um, than before. And so um, this these periods of civilizational decline uh, tend to be very violent um, and turbulent. Uh, they don't have to uh, progress this way, but it's it's been difficult for human societies uh, historically to break out of these cycles once once they've entered them. Um, and so the United States is, I would suggest, um, objectively in a period of decline. Um, and it's up to us to decide how we want to navigate that. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And you know what? I'm so glad that you brought up that aspect about the elites, because I remember seeing that graph. And yeah. if my memory serves me correctly, let me know if this is the, this is if this is correctly what you were referring to, Natalie. Um, these are the waves, right? Uh, popular mm -hmm. well-being. You know, we had the peak. It looks like uh, the peak. And and of course, remember the income tax at that point, you know, during the FDR administration, it was like up to 90 percent. Um, and then it started to decline. And then the elite overproduction, is that what you're referring to? Or am I talking about something different? Yeah. So um, it looks like the graph you have pulled up is the structural demographic uh, theory of history. So this this is a theory uh, proposed by Peter Turchin, who is 
actually an evolutionary biologist uh, by training, but um, has over the past several decades been writing about um, history and trying to apply some, some of the scientific insights uh, from evolutionary biology to the evolution of human societies. Um, and so this structural demographic um, theory suggests that elite overproduction is in fact uh, a major cause of social unrest. Um, and in fact, you can see it also in the archeological record where in periods of overpopulation, um, you see the skeletons of people from that period are actually smaller um, because people tend to be less well nourished or even malnourished. Um, and then, you know, society goes through these violent um, cycles of decline, um, population decreases, um, and then the, the agricultural world is able to support uh, the next birth uh, of population growth. So that was kind of the human cycle under agrarian societies until about the year 1800. What's interesting is that with the Industrial Revolution, in some ways, this process of rise and decline has been accelerated um, because capitalism is such an engine of economic growth and, and also of innovation and change. And so what, what we're seeing is that um, instead of there being you know, these great disparities where you, know, you can really kind of map more clearly discrete civilizations, more and more the world is a is an interconnected system and the polities are larger that we're talking about are larger and larger. Um, and so the, the structural demographic theory looks, looks a little different, but is broadly uh, in contour the same. It, it, and it's it's so fascinating. And I'm, you, when you were just talking, I was like, I've, I've seen that before. I've seen that graph. I've read that before. And do you believe, so it, it sounds like human history is just cycles. It, it's this, it, this is cycle going up, going down, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, unfortunately, my generation just happens to be at the pinnacle or the decline of that said cycle. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, certainly in, in Turchin's view, history has these cycles. Um, so he has, literally has a book called Cycles of History, um, where he writes about the rise and fall of several different civilizations. Um, the thing that carries the greatest potential for helping us break out of these cycles is in fact, entrepreneurial capitalism. Um, and that's why it's so interesting to me as a social scientist, because um, capitalism, le leaving aside ideological definitions is, uh, actually a social technology for generating capital from capital. Um, so you're actually putting capital to work um, to generate new capital. Uh, this is why you see things like uh, skyrocketing GDP growth um, as countries began to uh, move into capitalist systems of political economy. Um, that doesn't mean that the benefits of capital were distributed equally by, by any means. And that's a big part of what caused the social unrest of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, but nevertheless, this drive to innovate, this drive to do more with less, you know, to feed more people with less land, with less water, um, to uh, capitalize a global economy with, uh, let's say, you know, a digital ledger that that is um, it's distributed, but it's in some ways much more economical than relying on, you know, 130 separate governments uh, to maintain their own militaries and central banks. And so what we're seeing is um, the consolidation of some of the functions of the nation state, um, which, which were kind of these like hand cranked uh, forms of lawfulness um, and rule-based order that also created the conditions for uh, the rise of capitalism. And so we're, we're in this really interesting era where there, there actually is a lot of opportunity to break out of the cycle of decline. Um, but we have to have the right leadership who doesn't just play by the rules of a declining world order. Yeah. And speaking of right leadership, right. And again, I'm 
that like uh, put all the ideological stuff aside because I know a lot of people are going to focus on that. But speaking about a, a leader that has delivered results, right? And if you put mm -hmm. the ideological stuff aside, like I said, um, Naim Bukele, right? Mm -hmm. You know, drastically reduced uh, the murder rate in his country. Yeah. Um, record GDP growth, 10.3% uh, uh, ever since they started recording that since the 1960s. It's never happened before. Um, is that what you mean by a, 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 a type of leader that is thinking outside of the box? And how much of those results, Natalie, are due to the Bitcoin effect? And what I refer to the Bitcoin effect, and we had CK uh, from Bitcoin Magazine, I think it was yesterday's episode, where Bitcoin drastically changes your operating system. You know, what happens when you are denominating in a currency that increases in purchasing power over time versus denominating or using a currency that decreases in purchasing power over time. It completely revamps and changes your perspective on the world, right? You have, you have the ability to save and plan for a future. I would like to believe, but I'm also, I also am aware, I'm tremendously biased, that I think Bitcoin becoming legal tender played a small role in the success of El Salvador. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Um, I, I think that's one example of President Bukele um, really putting the interests of the people of El Salvador um, above the political consensus of the global financial system, um, which is, you know, has a very strident point of view about what is and is not money. Um, but uh, of course, President uh, Bukele uh, was president long before that, and before that had a political career in El Salvador. I think he started started out as mayor of a small town um, and built from there. And so, you know, his career has has been punctuated by a series of reforms that um, really cross ideological divides. Uh, it's one of the reasons that he. Uh, he was not really legible to the party that he was a, a member of. So his his father had been a prominent leader in that party, um, and uh, Bukele kind of inherited that party affiliation, but didn't really fit with the party's ideological agenda. And he was able to build coalitions with younger members of the op opposing party, uh, who also didn't quite fit with their party. Uh, and so uh, Ambassador uh, Milena Mayorga, who I recently had the pleasure of spending time with in, in Austin, um, and as we you know, set up this, this Bitcoin embassy of El Salvador in Austin, um, she was telling me about uh, being expelled from her party uh, for supporting President Bukele. Um, and in effect, you know, having to uh, resign from her party, being, you know, kicked out of her office in Congress uh, as a sitting congresswoman, because every office is allotted by a party, um, and yet remaining a sitting member of Congress. Um, and, you know, her party opposed her appointment as ambassador to the United States by the president. Um, you know, and in her, in her retelling of the story, he basically told her to just go. Um, and so this is, this is actually what we can think of as civic entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship isn't isn't just um, a for-profit endeavor. Anyone who has a point of view on how to get from point A to point B, which is all leadership is, is just getting you and your people from point A to point B. Um, anyone can be an entrepreneur anywhere you are. Yeah, 100 percent. And so we spoke about good leadership and we've spoken about how Naim Bukele and the party that I think is called Nuevas Ideas, which new ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So literally the, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> it's in the name. It doesn't try to hide it. Um, so we speak about a good form of governance, this new form of governance, right? That's kind of bridging the ideological, traditional tropes of the left and the right that dominated politics for the last hundred years or so. Um, but I want to bring it back to the United States and because you work at uh, BPI, you know, or, or you're part of BPI, better said, I apologize. Um, yeah. You definitely must be plugged into what is going on. Uh, Nick Carter wrote an amazing piece uh, called Operation Shook Point 2.0, yeah. 
where he laid out all the recent moves by the Biden administration to at least at least slow down the adoption of 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 Bitcoin in the United States. We have Caitlin Long's bank that was denied, uh, you know, federal banking charter, which would make it a competitive bank. Uh, it was denied. Uh, you had the hostile uh, bill uh, introduced by Elizabeth Warren and Senator Marshall um, and a bunch of other examples as well. So there's clearly this, you know, in our show, we call it a, this, this shadow war. It's not really public. It is in there. If you read the, the, the wording, like if you read the papers, it's there. They tell you exactly what's going on. I guess they don't advertise it very like they don't really talk about it much. So what's your take on that? Is this malicious? Is this come from a place of they're just not educated on the subject? Uh, what's your take on that? It's completely expected. Um, so the global financial system um, in over the past several generations has basically been um, a tool not only for U.S. foreign policy, but also for U.S domestic law, um, so the imposition of U.S. domestic law in other jurisdictions. Um, and this is because of the unique status of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. Um, and so any transaction that needs to be settled in U.S. dollars has to go through the U.S. Uh, banking system, which is fully subject to um, the political control uh, of the American government. Um, and so it's, it's unsurprising that this system would be used um, perhaps initially as a tool, um, a kind of proxy for kinetic conflict. So the American people, we've been through um, a number of wars over the past uh, few generations, but most recently, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, the global war on terror, which, you know, is still ongoing. Um, but the American people are tired of war. They, they don't want to be shipped off to new theaters. There's, there's very little support for um, actively putting U.S. men and women um, into a kinetic conflict. And so what do politicians do instead? They rely on the soft war um, of sanctions, which is economic warfare. Um, and that is a tool that the U.S. government has used um, with greater and greater frequency over the past uh, several administrations. And that um, our ability to sanction governments uh, is entirely predicated on our control of the global financial system. This is the main reason that the BRICS countries are building an alternative BRICS coin uh, commodity based uh, SDR um, and uh, launching, you know, CBDCs and, and building their own parallel financial system. It's not to say it's any better <laughs> than the U.S. controlled one, um, but all of this, you know, to your point, this weaponized financial infrastructure is now being used to combat um, the very antidote to this level of surveillance and political control, which is Bitcoin. Um, and so this is, I would say, you know, the first shots have been fired in the then they fight you stage. <laughs> Yeah, a hundred percent, and that's something that we 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 started picking up on very early on. And, and the case that we'd like to make it simply is that uh, I I don't see another way. There is an inevitable clash between this, right? You have a system of which a bureaucratic elite are basically picking and to simplify it, of course, picking and choosing who's entitled to use money or not. We know that when a country is sanctioned, it's really the population that is most hurt. Governments are able to successfully survive or circumvent them, right? Uh, if if that wasn't the case, North Korea would have been taken out a long time ago. But they're still going strong. Cuba as well, right? Literally right next to the United States. But it's actually the people of those countries that are the most hurt, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it is kind of it is the weaponization of money. And now you have something an open monetary network where it doesn't matter whether you're in Cuba and North Korea if you have internet access and a cell phone all of a sudden you're entitled or, or you have the ability to own private property for the first time in your life. Right. And you would think that the Bitcoin in a way really does represent the traditional American ethos. Um, so you would think that the American government 
would be open to something like this, but it's almost as if it's been, and again, like, I, I don't want to sound too hyperbolic or whatever, but it's almost as if it's been taken over by this Frankenstein bureaucratic creature that's been funded by this money printer. Um, I don't know what your response is to that. Yeah. Um, no, certainly. I mean, from my point of view, Bitcoin is a crystallization of the American project in in a monetary object, <laughs> in, a, in commodity money. Um, but it's a it's a measure of how far the political consensus, the Overton window of what is acceptable um, to advocate for politically uh, in the United States, how far away that has shifted from the generation of of the founding of this country, you know, where, as I pointed out uh, on Peter McCormack, uh, George Washington, you know, believed the United States should not have a standing army um, because he saw standing army as um, a precursor for tyranny, that that army can be weaponized against the people um, just as quickly as it can be weaponized um, to fight foreign uh, invaders. Um, and so, you know, we we not only have the a standing army, we have the world's largest like ever in all of human history, uh, military industrial complex. Um, and so that is that has created a set of incentives of game conditions that uh, has incentivized a lot of American leaders to perpetuate that system. Um, and so, you know, as as often happens, you know, well-meaning people try to reform the system from within. They generally fail. Um, and so reform then has to come from without. Um, and historically, often that's happened through some kind of catastrophe, you know, natural disaster, uh, plague, uh, warfare, um, you know, enemies taking advantage of um, of the the weakness of the internal system. Um, but in the case of Bitcoin, what's so wonderful about it is uh, that it's a bottom up solution. So it's completely orthogonal. There's no permission seeking from the state um, or from mainstream political opinion. It's simply there as a technology, as a tool that anybody can adopt. Um, and more and more people will choose to adopt it. Um, Bitcoin's adoption is outpacing the adoption of the internet. Um, and so as that happens, what, what we'll see is the creation of facts on the ground that the state has to deal with, um, whether they like it or not. Um, and, and so we're, we're going to find out what, what that looks like in practice. We are definitely going to find out that is, that is undeniable. And I tweeted this out the a couple of days ago. And one of the things that fascinates me about Bitcoin is its ability to expose incentives. I don't think that there's anything else that I've seen that does this because we are led to believe that we live under a government that's by the people for the people. I don't think it's a government by the people for the people anymore. I think it's a government by the government for the government, right? And then not to mention the revolt, the so-called revolving door in the imperial city between, you know, Wall Street and positions of power in government, right? So, yes, I, I, I do see that eventually it's going to say what, what, what gives, you know, what is actually going on here? What is the deal? Does that worry you? Uh, what does that look like uh, on your side? And of course, you know, you're part of BPI. Um, so you are in the vanguard, so to speak. You're in the trenches. Uh, so <laughs> in your perspective, what, what do you foresee? What, what do you think is going to happen in, uh, in the next five to 10 years or so? And before you answer that, you know, I, I want to mention Sailor's line, right? Uh, I want to be a winner. I don't want to be a martyr. So I think people like Michael Saylor are seeing the writing on the wall as well. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is no virtue in losing. Um, and, and this is one of the things that I think has been so upsetting uh, to many who have seen activism as their path to political reform. Um, activism tends to, you know, whether 
left or right or whatever the political orientation is, activism as a mode of engagement um, often prioritizes uh, virtue signaling to the in-group over winning. Um, and so what we've seen is various activist causes uh, arise uh, attempting to reform the the set of incentives and game conditions you know that uh, have resulted in you know elite capture of the state and they've all failed <laughs> um, and and so the the question then becomes you know what's the alternative to activism if you're if you're a concerned person who generally wants to create change um, well building alternatives right is is a really important uh, avenue and that's what bitcoin is um, but more importantly it's also a kind of you know if if your goal if you have an objective a uh, political objective let's say um, you need to develop the skill to read the room you know to to assess what's actually uh, feasible under the social uh, conditions that you are amidst. Um, simply being right, um, <laughs> entering a room and and screaming, you know, your views, that's the activist mode. Um, and ultimately, it doesn't matter. It makes you a target, um, and it often makes you a martyr. And so the point the point is not to be right. The point is to build the social coalitions that can instantiate over time what you believe is right. Um, and that actually takes things like real skill, like you have to have operational skill, technical skill, social skill, relational skill. Um, you have to become the person who can build the institutions that will embody the change that you want to see. If, if, you know, if all of your theory of change is um, let's elect the best president, I mean, well, th that's just a fully top down theory of change. Like if, if only we had the right God King, we could solve all of our problems. Well, that's a profoundly authoritarian um, point of view on how social change happens, which is not to say that leadership doesn't matter. It absolutely does. Leaders, most of all, are, are role models. So the behavior of leaders is what gets uh, imitated um, consciously or unconsciously by the people they lead. Um, and this is why, you know, from my point of view, um, in these periods of crisis, it can it often be important for institutions to do less with more integrity. Um, so that's what I would suggest um, the federal government um, needs to do at this point. Uh, do less, but with more integrity. And we're already seeing gridlock at the federal level means that in a federal system, uh, power devolves to the states. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I founded the Texas Bitcoin Foundation, um, because I think it's important um, to lead locally at a scale where you can more meaningfully impact change. One of the reasons that we're seeing so many amazing things happen in El Salvador is because it's a small country. Um, and you can you can actually run a, a small country like a city state um, or a large company. Um, so you can have that level of executive leadership that really gets things done. That's much harder to do in a country of 400 million people like the United States. Yeah, 100 percent. And then it, it, it and, uh, I, and I've had these thoughts and it, it goes deeper than that as well. Right. Because it's like if you think about it, if people start using an alternative to the U.S. dollar, right what is really holding these states together mm -hmm. right and that's a really big question and then another component to that is i think a lot of these states would get along even with their very very deep ideological differences because they wouldn't be competing for the money printer and i think that a lot of the uh political upheaval is because that's what it's that, that that's what the competition is about, right? So, do you believe it's it's a more it's a more you know? And Mark Moss has, has touched upon this too, where we reach peak uh, centralization. Now we're heading into decentralization. Do you see that in the future, where the state's individual sovereignty is more important than this huge 
federal government um, that I don't think would be as powerful if they didn't have the money printer. Mm -hmm. No doubt. This, the crisis of um, the ability to get things done on the one hand and a crisis of purpose more broadly, you know, what, what is America? What, what is the American project is forcing us to return to the more fundamental question of what is sovereignty? Um, so what does it mean to be a sovereign people? Um, this, this question of sovereignty is something that has kind of been taken for granted, um, you know, in periods of peace and prosperity, uh, it can seem either irrelevant or self-evident. Um, but now we're forced to ask that question again. Um, and I would suggest that sovereignty is several things. One, it's the ability to defend oneself. So to protect one's integrity, physical integrity, territorial integrity from invaders. Um, two, it is self-sufficiency. So the ability to generate the material resources and the economic growth that sustain your polity over time so that you're not dependent on other polities. Um, and then three, it's purpose. Um, why, why is this community together at all? What, what is it doing together? Um, and so I would suggest that, um, you know, from a, from a territorial defense standpoint, there is a very strong case for the uh, states of America to remain in a union. Um, I, I think it, we truly do have some dangerous enemies and um, us hanging together uh, in a territorial defense pact uh, makes a lot of sense from a sovereignty standpoint. Uh, similarly, um, makes a lot of sense from an economic standpoint. The United States is, is one of the most resource rich countries in the world. Um, I mean, we could be fully self-sufficient um, for food, for energy, um, for many natural resources if we wanted to be. Um, and that's because of our, our territory, the natural resources that we're blessed with. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, I think economically and militarily, there's a very strong case to maintain a union. But it's that third thing, the question of purpose of who are we as Americans? What is the American project? Um, that question has to be answered in order for the first two elements of sovereignty to continue to have meaning. Yeah. And, but so, okay. So interesting. So, but what if those differences, cause again, and I, I'm looking at it from the tr traditional ideological sense. If you look at red States and blue States, they will answer that question completely differently, right? Mm -hmm. So is that necessary in order for union to remain specifically if the money that people are using in this states are not, it's not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily the dollar, it's Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. and, and for my opinion, I think, I think that those differences aren't, you don't need to agree is what I'm trying to say. I think people are just gonna go to whatever state they see you know, is better for them. Yeah, no, I, I think the beautiful thing about Bitcoin uh, from a community building standpoint is that it's enemy money. Uh, so you don't have to agree uh, with me about anything, but we can agree on the value of this currency and the method of transacting this currency. Um, and, and what that points to is the opportunity, if you can take it, of a union built on true diversity, true difference, um, where we don't have to be alike. We don't have to, you know, make the red states blue states or, or vice versa. Um, I can actually have a common project with you, even if we have profoundly different worldviews because the things we do agree on, um, the basic principles of liberty, um, prosperity, of uh, respect, of justice for all, um, these are things that we can actually coalesce around as a people, even if our lived expression of that 
differs. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I, I want to go back to the very beginning of the conversation where you, you touched upon capitalism, Yeah. right? I'm a big fan of capitalism. Um, capitalism has definitely taken the most people out of poverty in human history. You look it, it, it's apparent. You look at a chart, it doesn't lie. Why do you think capitalism has gotten such a bad rap? And that that's the initial question. The second question is, do you think that it's not necessarily that it's the deficiencies of capitalism? It's maybe that we haven't been living in capitalism, but it's been advertised as capitalism. I don't think it, I don't think you can have capitalism if there's a central bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and, and many would agree with you. Um, I think part of the problem with the term capitalism is that people who use it rarely define it. Um, and they're, there are real disagreements, including by like economists and, and scholars of uh, economic history about what capitalism is. Um, you know, some would say that it is the private ownership of the means of production. Um, well, uh, yeah, maybe, but then you look at countries like China where the state owns significant stakes in virtually any enterprise that matters. Um, and they are one of the most uh, rapidly expanding capitalist economies in the world. Um, and so if it's not private ownership, then what is it? Um, as I suggested early on in this conversation, I think capitalism is actually just the tool of compounding capital from capital. Um, so whether that is reinvesting profits in new um, in new development, research and development to generate greater innovations and greater profits over time, um, or uh, financial capital, uh, the miracle of compound interest, um, which which is you know something that has uh, that has enabled people to passively grow their wealth um, for centuries. So it's, it's these technologies that are capitalist and that enable economic growth. I think what we've seen though in recent years is in the United States and in many of the advanced economies is a much stronger shift toward the financial capital side of things um, and a de-emphasis on entrepreneurial capitalism. The, um, the capitalism of investing resources to generate new innovations um, that then generate greater and greater profits over time. Um, and that is the form of capitalism that fuels the productive economy that financial capitalism depends on. Um, and so, you know, part, part of the like elite uh, expansion that we've been talking about in these secular cycles is the rise of the global financial elite. Um, they, you know, make their living extraordinary amounts of money, um, basically uh, arbitraging the real economy. Um, and But that, that process of growth can only continue so far because at some point, the, the real economy has to produce the returns that justify the valuations and um, the, the uh, speculation that's being done um, by financial capitalists. Uh, and so many of the critiques of capitalism are often critiques specifically of financial capitalism or critiques of worker exploitation, which is a serious problem in every economic system. You know, feudalism, capitalism, uh, <laughs> mercantilism, uh, whatever. Um, anytime there are power imbalances, there, there are abuses of power. And so it's very important when we have these conversations that we actually define our terms and be very precise about what we're talking about instead of using these flag terms to signal like, I'm with this guy or I'm on this team. <laughs> no, and, 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 and it's, so, it's so fascinating. And of course, you know, we simplified on Simply Bitcoin. You know, we, we, we call them the unproductive class, the, the rent seekers, so to speak. And but... Do you, do you, where, how, how does, I'll ask you this question. 
does Bitcoin fix capitalism? Does Bitcoin make capitalism better in the way that you just defined it? And if it does, how so? I, I would never say that Bitcoin fixes capitalism because um, it's, it's a cate- category error. Uh, they're, two, they're two different things. Um, what, what I think Bitcoin does do is it makes commodity money accessible to everyone. Um, you know, you could, you could replatform the entire global economy from a single Bitcoin, um, not only because it's subdivisible um, into a uh, hundred million parts, but um, because those, each of those parts of a Bitcoin exist in a trade pair with every other unit of account and medium of exchange, every other currency in the world. Um, and so what Bitcoin is, is it's, it's kind of, it's this universal form of collateral. Um, and in an economy where, so, so, you know, lending, uh, bank, private bank creation of money, um, through, through lending, um, is a chief engine of economic expansion, uh, and of capitalism. Um, you couldn't, you couldn't see the kinds of growth. Um, that we've seen in human economies over the past few centuries if you didn't have credit. Um, And that also means debt. Um, The problem is, though, when you have so much credit (laughs) and so much debt that your collateral can no longer in any way meaningfully um, backstop that debt. At that point, you have a recipe for collapse. And so what Bitcoin can do is can serve as this politically neutral, universal uh, collateral layer um, that can actually backstop many, many of the areas, either private or sovereign around the world that are suffering debt crises. Interesting. It's very interesting. You know, you've you've really opened my mind to getting into the the very specifics of capitalism and defining that term. I think that I've definitely, you know, I'm definitely guilty of of using the the flag waving term of what I define as as capitalism, which is, you know, free market. You know, the entrepreneurs build things and, you know, the the market sends you price signals, et cetera, et cetera. But never looked at it from the financial capitalism and the other aspect. And I find that really, really interesting. Now, you said something there that I'm sure the audience would love to hear what you mean by that. You said that I asked you if Bitcoin fixes capitalism and you said that is a, a categorical error. What, what did you mean by that and why did you say that? Um, a category error just just means that we're talking about two different categories of things um, in a way that's incommensurate. So capitalism is a system of political economy, whereas Bitcoin is a money, uh, a form of currency. Um, you know, there there could be, you could make a historical, perhaps economic argument that um, the form of money um, somehow influences the type of political economy in a society. But I think that argument would be very hard to make because for for most of human history, um, you know, coins, currency were uh, commodity, some form of commodity money, gold and silver. But the economies were not capitalist; they were feudal, um, and then potentially, you know, mercantile as as this transition state between feudalism and and capitalism. Um, and so, it's not the money itself that will magically create for us the system of political economy we want that actually is up to us like we as people have to you know have to decide do do we want um a a nationalist uh king-based political order and there are many that do i mean there there are many uh and growing number of people today who are just like you know democracy is a failed experiment we need to go back to monarchy um, and, you know, and nationalism, uh, you know, free trade needs to go away. We need to develop, we need to adopt uh, protectionist policies, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's no guarantee that the system of 
free trade and liberal democracy that we've known over the past several generations will continue into the future. We actually have to fight for that if that's what we believe in. <laughs> yeah. And and to play devil's advocate, right? A lot of people would advocate for like look at how, you know, look at how Dubai is doing and look at how these yeah. you know, nation states are doing that they don't have democracy. It's it's totally it's an absolute mar- uh, monarchy. But they are kind of run and and again, I, I remember what you're talking about El Salvador. You look at Dubai, it is kind of run like a like a company, but you can't deny that, you know, uh, 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 the the emirate of Dubai or whatever the king or the leader there has brought a tremendous amount of prosperity to his people um, without a liberal democracy. So what would your response be to that? Yeah. So um, authoritarian leaders um, always have some sense for what their people want, prefer, um, and what they will tolerate as far as exercises of of their power or the government's power. Um, And so, you know, every government, there is a dynamic, a push-pull between state and society, uh, regardless of, you know, whether it's a democracy or a monarchy or a dictatorship even. Um, And so, you know, this is why uh, we saw China uh, finally dropped the zero COVID policy um, because the Chinese people uh, finally stood up and said, absolutely no more of this, like enough. Um, you know, they started uh, burning the the COVID detention centers and, um, you know, physically uh, rioting in some places, holding demonstrations. And the government realized that um, they, their other policy priorities, including the priority of remaining in power, um, depended on acquiescing to some of the demands from society. Um, So, you know, so every government does this to some extent. The question is, you know, uh, are you as a citizen of these places happy with the extent to which you feel represented and heard? you know, if, if you live in a society where, um, you know, the most egregious abuses of government power eventually stop because the people have to threaten to riot, um, chances are your your day to day life probably isn't that great. Um, and so the, the promise of representative democracy is that people can actually have a say in how they're governed um, on a much wider range of things than under a typical authoritarian arrangement. Um, But as we've seen in the American experiment, this can be very hard to do at scale. Um, And so often it's most effective for people who want to feel heard and feel represented to get involved at the local level um, of their government because they have the most uh, potential to have direct impact there. Um, it's much harder to do uh, at the federal level. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so Natalie, I, I want to use the you know the last you know the last fifteen minutes or so of of the podcast to talk about what we perceive on Simply Bitcoin, and we are slaves to the news cycle, so we see this every single day. There's not, I don't think there's one day that this this topic has not been brought up. Uh, I want to talk about central bank digital currencies. Um, of course, Bitcoiners feel very strongly about them. Um, but my concern is the vast majority of people, specifically in developed countries, Alex Gladstein, you know, the love of his book, people that have financial privilege. They live in countries that have relatively stable uh, uh, fiat currencies relatively low inflation rates. It's not that high that people quite understand what's going on. Um, and they're just like, okay, you know, this, this is great. Um, and then I want to ask you about uh, a paper that the U S treasury wrote. The name of the paper was, uh, it's called the future of money and payments. And it was response to an executive order by the Biden administration. And in that entire paper, they, they mentioned that the future of money in the eyes of the U S treasury is, Stable coins, payment platforms, and CBDCs, mm-hmm. but they never mention Bitcoin. So yeah. that being said, Natalie, 
why didn't they mention Bitcoin? And what are your thoughts on CBDCs? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tall order to to expect representatives of the state to ever endorse a stateless currency. Um, so again, you know, fully par for the course um, expected behavior on on the part of the Treasury. Um, CBDCs are, um, I mean, the the current. Uh, financial system or the current dollar system, let's say that, is already fully digitized and fully surveilled. <laughs> so, you know, as I was saying before, like anybody who is transacting in, in U.S. dollars generally has to go through the U.S. banking system. Um, and that information is fully AML KYC. Um, it's shared with, you know, virtually all police agencies in, in every state around the world, because, you know, these, these agencies all share information with each other. Um, so there's really nothing private that you can do if you're transacting with dollars uh, today. Um, the main impetus, as I can see, for a CBDC in the United States is that uh, China's doing it. And there is a whole host of US politicians who believe that we have to imitate um, the the other government, um, let's let's even say enemy government, because for many of these people, these politicians, they see China as an enemy. Um, we have to imitate our enemy uh, in order to beat them. Well, let me let me tell you, as as an entrepreneur, <laughs> as an American and as a human being, you don't win by imitating. You don't ape your way into uh, power and leadership. Um, so, you know, the the U.S. government, if, if it does, in fact, um, pursue a CBDC, um, will literally be uh, owning itself um, and and destroying liberty in the process. What remains of liberty, which is the anonymous uh, bearer asset that is physical cash. Um, and so that's really the the other purpose of the CBDC. So on the one hand, you know, we're FOMOing into becoming China. Um, on the other, um, we we want information about you know everything that you're spending fifty cents on. Um, we want to tax it. We want to um, surveil it. We want to incentivize it or de-incentivize it, um, prohibit it, um, or even require it, make it mandatory. Blah blah blah. Um, so by doing away with the last vestige of anonymous transacting, which is physical cash, um, that sort of completes the, <laughs> the circle of, of financial surveillance. And there will not be a CBDC that doesn't afford this, um, regardless of what some, some proponents say that, no, we can do like a freedom version in America. Impossible. Um, that that is, is politically impossible and technologically uh, infeasible. Um, so then the question becomes, um, is Bitcoin um, or is the community of Bitcoiners ready to build the financial infrastructure that serves as a meaningful alternative to physical cash? Bitcoin has to become the anonymous digital bearer asset um, that physical cash was. Absolutely. And so... And I agree with you. And, and and here's the thing where I think I, I'm feeling a little bit more hope. And, you know, the you, you're talking about the Bitcoin embassy, the El Salvador and Bitcoin embassy, specifically in Texas. I see I see states, whether, you know, it, you saw this, uh, you know, Mississippi passing a mm -hmm. law that would make it very friendly for Bitcoin miners. Yeah. The law in Wyoming, which I absolutely loved, which we would protect private keys. I see individual states adopting a Bitcoin standard way before the federal government. Yeah, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is this is a time for states to lead. You know, like we were talking about earlier, when there's a gridlock or inaction at the federal level, power devolves to the states. So states really have the opportunity to differentiate themselves uh, right now. Um, the problem with any policy-driven approach here 
is that in general, elected officials are uh, masters of the art of the law, <laughs> um, which is the coercive violence of the state. Um, and often, you know, they have one tool and that is making new laws. <laughs> um, and so I, I would suggest that we actually don't need new laws or many new laws to accommodate the widespread day-to-day -day use of Bitcoin. Um, I think the, the American constitution um, amply lays the groundwork for freedom money um, to exist anywhere in the United States. Um, and so the challenge is going to be the more laws you make, um, the more you can inadvertently make certain behaviors illegal that you didn't anticipate before. Um, like if you make a law that says, you know, Bitcoin's great. We love Bitcoin. Now, suddenly, like every currency that people want to use, like the question is going to be, do we need a new law for every single form of money? Um, that people want to use. Um, like if you if you pass a law at the state's level that says, um, you know, we have freedom of speech. Well, that's already in the federal constitution. So are you suggesting that um, that maybe there are other rights uh, that need to be enshrined by state statute? Um, and so law is, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I think part of part of the problem, with candidly the situation we're in politically is that we have had lawyers uh, leading us uh, politically for generations. Um, and they know how to make laws and interpret laws. Um, but what if, you know, we could, we could take a, a drastic step back and, and just start culling, you know, some of the complexity of our legal system saying, maybe we don't need these laws over determining um, these micro areas of behavior that are already covered by these other laws um, that are more fundamental or primary. Um, so I think that's a much broader, longer term project of political reform that we need to undertake as a country. A hundred percent. And I, I think, you know, and I think that as more people take Bitcoin into self-custody, I never forget Kaiser's quote, right? I'm assuming you saw Kaiser in Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. And I think as more people take personal responsibility, take self custody of their wealth of which they're outsourcing currently, I think their interpretation or how they look at their relationship between the states and the individual, the state and the government, I mean, the individual and the government is going to change. Um, and I think that that makes me optimistic. Uh, to see actual, you know, uh, actual change. But so I take it you're not a fan of, of legal tender laws. <laughs> you know, any law can potentially serve a purpose in a particular context. Um, but money, like speaking sociologically, anthropologically, uh, money has only ever been created by states, by governments um, over the past few thousand years. Um, for the vast majority of human history, money was an emergent phenomenon. It was, you know, people using uh, collectibles, things of value, um, and establishing uh, these objects as mediums of exchange. And even when states started issuing money, um, they were by no means the only uh, issuers of, of units of account and medium of exchange. So most people didn't actually have access to physical money, uh, like silver or gold coins. It was very rare for people to have that. And so what did like ordinary villagers, you know, in, in Europe, for example, use to keep track of credits and debits? Well, ledgers, you know, that they had like sticks or like... Uh, rocks where they would notch, you know, debits and credits. Um, and then that um, eventually evolved into uh, double entry uh, bookkeeping and a practice of accounting, um, which is still like the ledger is actually the most fundamental unit of money. And ledgers are not created by this by a state like some mythical or state like anybody can create a ledger. 
And so money is actually a bottom up social phenomenon, very much like language. You know, your, your government doesn't teach you language. You learn language um, in community, in your family and in, in um, you know, your community of others. And so it's it's important that even if we're temporarily using a top down social technology like a legal tender law, that we don't confuse that law for some like universal, immutable law of nature. <laughs> You know, and, and it, it makes absolutely sense. But again, it, it makes sense to Bitcoiners, right? The Bitcoiners, it's so yeah. obvious. Um, and I think that if you try to live on a Bitcoin standard in the United States, the tax implications, I think, is like the 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 biggest pain in the ass because you have to, you know, you have to do the accounting and you have to like, if I sell this, you know, what what's going on? There's a capital gains or there's a loss. Um, but do you think that that is the type of law that will just naturally dissipate? as just more people adopt because in the way that I would compare it is, is like, it, it's like, as if you're trying to regulate the internet, mm -hmm. you know, you can only do so much, but the internet is going to do what the internet is going to do. And even in, even with the, the, the great firewall in China, right. You know, yeah. this country, they could censor as much as they want, but it still seems that some type of information still seeps through. Right. Yeah. So what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, people will continue to generate new forms of currency as, as long as there is human society. Um, the, the potential value of legal tender laws is um, in a social context before the internet, where, you know, there were literally hundreds of different forms of money in, in the United States. Like people, you know, in one neighborhood could, it used a different form of money than they did in another neighborhood. Um, and so there is value in standardization um, because standardization creates efficiency. You know, if I go from Texas to Missouri, I know that the money I'm bringing with me is still good in Missouri because it's the law. Um, so there is some benefit um, in standardization, which can also be a kind of centralization. Um, the problem is that centralization tends to take on um, a self-perpetuating logic, um, particularly where it accrues power to people. Um, people you know, who are responsible for one area of centralization or standardization um, then want to be responsible for more areas. <laughs> um, and so the state uh, you know, go, quickly goes from um, an administrative like helper to human communities to being this heavy layer that sucks up more and more resources and that is more and more complicated to navigate and maintain. Um, and at that point, you know, it tends to collapse and this, there's a decentralizing uh, correction in human societies. And so, you know, I think that um, legal tender laws, you know, they, they may or may not continue to be useful. Um, if we have an information economy, an internet and, and lightning network based economy where, you know, FX exchanges are instantaneous, um, they're possible from, from virtually any currency into any other currency in any jurisdiction. Um, at that point, you know, it almost doesn't matter uh, whether something is or isn't legal tender um, because everything is so uh, quickly translatable. So, and just to wrap it up, Natalie, and this has been a very fascinating conversation, specifically what, you know, what really blew my mind tonight was how you went in depth into the definition of capitalism and what the different forms of capitalism you define too. And I thought that was really interesting. Now, from your vantage point, what do you think are the largest obstacles specifically for uh, hyper Bitcoinization or, you know, cause that's what we all want because we're Bitcoiners mm -hmm. at the end of the day. What are the biggest obstacles that you foresee uh, within this w within this decade, you know, in, until 2030? I think it's going to be the fiat on ramps and off ramps. That's where they're going to try to come for us. Um, and that's where we need to simply build alternatives that they can't take down. Yeah. And in 
and what makes you say it's that specific? Are you looking at the laws that were, you know, the 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 laws, the the Mika laws in Europe, right? Where they're literally saying uh, any transaction over a thousand has to be reported. There's rumblings that they want to make uh, they want to make use their terms, not mine, un unhosted wallets or unhosted addresses. I think they turn they change the terminology and everything uh, illegal, or they want to KYC it. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yes. So there are going to be continual attempts to um, to use the capabilities of digital technologies um, to uh, remove all of the self-sovereignty and freedoms that people used to enjoy holding physical wallets and physical cash. Um, so you know, these laws, they're going to keep coming just like, just like the laws, um, to, uh, to require software companies to introduce exceptional access, um, for law enforcement, you know, to encrypted products, like every few years, you know, some new, uh, congressman or woman, um, you know, at the federal level, sometimes even at the state level, will introduce a bill to require exceptional access, which would, you know, break encryption for everyone. Um, so Bitcoin is now kind of in, in the same fight where um, the state uh, is going to continuously try to get rid of any self-sovereign uh, element to the use of this currency. Um, and that involves certainly how you hold your Bitcoin. So, you know, whether you self-host it, um, but it also involves your freedom to freely exchange that Bitcoin into other forms of value. Um, and so because fiat currencies are so heavily politicized and they're controlled by the states that issue them, um, they're going to create all kinds of choke points to basically make Bitcoin unusable uh, in various jurisdictions. Yeah. yeah, I see that as well. And then there's the the social attack on the, you know, Bitcoin mining's energy uses as, as well. Yeah. I, I do yeah. see that as the two the two attack vectors for sure. Natalie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today on Simply Bitcoin IRL. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you online? Sure. Um, so you can find me on Twitter uh, at nsmolensky, um, also at txbitcoinfoundation.org. Um, and you can also just go to the website and learn more about what we're up to at the foundation. Um, we survive on donations from Bitcoiners. So if you believe that this kind of uh, obsessive nerdery is needed to advance our cause, uh, throw us a few sats. Um, we'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. You heard that, guys. Take agency, take action. This is what you do. Contribute to the good fight, the separation of money and state. Natalie, thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on today. If I ask you, please hang hang out in, in backstage. There's about a 30 second delay while I wrap this up. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, shout out to uh, shout out to our sponsor, swanbitcoin.com. Best place to stack sats. Check out the new IRA just launched as well. And of course, the Bitcoin 2023 conference. It'll be the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. You can use promo code SIMPLY. And you can see us tomorrow on the live show, Simply Bitcoin Live, 12.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Love you all, guys. See you tomorrow.